Um, so welcome everybody to another session of Classic Metal Class. Uh, Scott is here with me and we're discussing one of our longtime favorite bands and some of the recent, let's call them tiffs that have been happening in social media and the um, the heavy metal sphere online. Uh, we're also going to be talking a little bit about two books. Um, it's hard to see it here. KK Downing's Heavy Duty, Days and Nights and Judas Priest and Rob Halford's Confess, in which some of this story is being brought out. So what is, what is the, the issue? What is the story? You could say that, you know, part of it is that there's currently two existing, and I would say rival bands that are Judas Priest. There's actual Judas Priest. And then there's KK's Priest, which is led by KK Downing, has Tim Ripper Owens, a former Judas Priest singer with them. And this, this takes us back to episode three of this class, where we talked about the metaphysical identity of bands and changes. And, you know, if there's two rats or two Queensrikes or two Saxons, which one is the real one? Um, so that's one issue. But we've also got a couple other things mixed into this. It turns out it's a very complicated situation. So KK Downing, uh, who's you know a great uh, metal guitarist, one of the founding members of Judas Priest. He retired from the band in 2011, and he was permanently replaced by Richie Faulkner at that time. And, and there was some bad blood about that that we'll talk about. And um, Downing left because of significant disagreements with management and bandmates about Epitaph, but also about other stuff as well. And the official um, story that was out is, is Downing is focusing on his golf course. He, he had this Asbury Hall residence and on building luxury residential developments. Um, he got into all sorts of legal messes about this, and he ended up selling the royalty rights for 136 Judas Priest songs at that time. Meanwhile, Judas Priest was supposed to be retiring. Epitaph in 2000, you know, starting in 2011, and we saw him in 2012 uh, on that tour. That was supposed to be the final tour, and it, and it kind of made sense because you could tell that that Rob Halford wasn't. Um, all that healthy. He was kind of shuffling around on stage. Um, you know, he he needed to take little breaks during the songs to be able to hit the high notes. You could tell he was kind of struggling. And um, shortly after that, they decided, no, nope, we're, we're, we're not done. <laughs> we're going to record some new albums. And they, they, you know, they continued with uh, Glenn Tipton and Richie Faulkner on guitar. Uh, and then Tipton had to semi-retire due to Parkinson's disease. And so this is where the, the story starts to get, you know, really um, gritty. So K.K. Downing, <clears throat> um, who, you know, had had a pretty strong break with Judas Priest, and there had been a lot of back and forth tips within the band before that, he wants to rejoin. He, in his view, he should have been asked when Glenn Tipton uh, is semi-retiring to take Glenn Tipton's place. Instead, they bring in um, the current, you know, producer of Judas Priest um, and, and uh, you know, a good guitarist in his own right. And they, they, they bring him in, uh, Andy Sneap, and we, that's what we actually saw in the later two, you know, 2010s touring around these two younger guys, Richie Faulkner and Andy Sneap on, on guitar, um, Rob Halford singing, Ian Hill still there, you know, grinding away on bass, and K.K. Downing starts talking a lot of, um, a lot of smack, let's say, right? And some of what, now here's what we're going to try to parse out. Some of it actually seems to be well-founded. Maybe he does actually have a legitimate claim. And then KK Downing, so KK Downing is trying to get himself into Priest, and that's a no-go. So then he says, well, I'm going to found a new band, KK's Priest. And he recruits uh, Tim Ripper Owens. So, you know, that's part of Judas Priest at one time when Rob Halford's gone. He recruits Les Binks. Les Binks is a Judas Priest uh, drummer. Now he'll be replaced very quickly by Sean Elg. And then he recruits two other guys, Voodoo Six bassist Tony Newton and uh, AJ Mills, who uh, is from this band called Hostel, who um, Downing was producing at the time. And Downing by this time is also like sold off his house and, and actually bought KK's Steel Mill, a place where 
they can play. And it, it's, it's a, a, you know, a, a music hall, let's call it in bar. So recently, Scott and I, we were actually going to do a different topic this month. Um, but recently, there have been some interviews with KK Downing disparaging priest decisions, saying that he ought to be in the band, saying that KK's priest is the next big thing. There's, it's kind of all over the map, the stuff that he's saying. And so I, I, I sent this thing to Scott and I was like, have you seen this? And, and Scott's like, wow, there's, there's a lot going on there. And we we're like, well, maybe we should actually, you know, we like talking about ethical issues. It seems like yeah. there's quite a few involved here. Maybe we should uh, jump into this. Um, and so we've been talking back and forth about this. Is, is there anything you want to add about this, Scott, at, at this point? Because um, I've been talking a lot. <laughs> well, that's fine. It's, about, it's been uh, uh, great history to catch us all. And when you sent me that, I actually didn't really have an idea that that was going on. Um, and, you know, there's something in, um, as far as like the notes and us chatting, what we should throw into the discussion today is not only um, the rights of KK and the band and what they think, but Again, we keep talking about this, uh, the right the audience has to, or the fans, like what would, what would the fans want? And does that equate into it? Would, would the fans love to see them reunite? And, um, and just how bad is the blood, I guess, is the, so, you know, con considering like, what do you think the fans would want? Yeah. Is that even in the equation? Well, it is in part. Uh, certainly on the side of uh, K.K. Downing, who tries to say that, you know, like, in a certain way, he's he's the, the really authentic player for Priest and the fan favorite. And, you know, um, what the fans would really like to see is, you know, a, a reunited Priest. Um, I mean, it's, it still wouldn't be a completely reunited place, Priest because he would be playing with Richie Faulkner. Right. You know, um, it, 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 so there's some rhetoric involved you could say of using the fans i don't know i don't know that the fans really do want to see that there uh, in the metal forums there are partisans of both sides i can say that and there's there okay. seem to be a lot of people who are pissed off at um kk downing for constantly <laughs> sniping at priest and and also saying i want to be in there um chris says heads are gonna roll yeah <laughs> and, it's, and, it, and it's interesting because i in doing the research for this i you know i was looking at some other things and kk downing um there was like a list of what he thinks are the the 10 best you know judas priest songs and he he said that's one of them um but the other thing with that you know so that was off of the heaviest album that that priest i i want to say that defenders of the faith is actually heavier than than painkiller um just because of the way it, it's done now that's debatable we talked yeah, about that's the, debatable yeah painkiller is pretty pretty happening <laughs> it is yeah yeah but um that's one of the heaviest songs off of that heaviest of albums and kk downing has been positioning himself as being like you know the authentic uh, going back to the, you know, the, the real priest sound, he's been kind of using that idea um, that he was involved in the moving away from the proggy stuff to, to the uh, more bare bones, heavy metal. And so I think that's, that's part of the picture. Um, yeah. So the audience thing though, um, I guess we'd, we'd have to like do surveying. Yeah, I mean, the forums is, is, a, is a clever thing to check out what people are saying. I just want to interject here something really interesting as far as generations go. Um, mm. My students at Berkeley, they're big Priest fans, the metal guys, but they're, everybody's number one album is Painkiller. Like everybody that's the that soul to learn, you know, they're like, you know, and, you know, I've had four students in the last few years do that solo from that song. <laughs> <laughs> as their proficiency piece and that's you know if you're a priest fan that's the solo you got to tackle like it's that's really interesting. interesting because when we came up you know all the other albums were coming up while we were you know in high school or in junior high and so we saw these in real time so it's great to see somebody looking way back at the catalog and they all jumped to painkiller yeah and, yeah um you know these students are wearing priest shirts in in school like the metal heads you know iron maiden and priest are like the two and sabbath Although I guess there's a three, but but 
Yeah, that's that's kind of like my two cents for what I've observed of the, the people that are ages 18 to 21 right now. When we when we did that episode on the top five albums of that's like right. key, key bands like Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, uh, Motorhead, Dio, it was split between, if I remember right, Painkiller and Screaming for Vengeance, wasn't it? Yeah. My vote was Screaming for Vengeance. Yeah. And I, I was an outlier with Sin After Sin. That's a great one, though. I mean, I mean, a- yeah, we could actually talk about like different periods. Like there's the early, you know, first three albums moving into stained class, right? Where they're they're sort of formulating their sound. There is a lot of proggy stuff going on. Then there's the, we could call it the um, classic Judas Priest thing. Every- everything from stained class up to defenders of the faith. Then we have this, you know, kind of weirdo what, what's going on here, turbo uh, uh, ram it down. And then painkiller comes on top of that. And painkiller is like a return to form, except now incorporating new drumming techniques and stuff like that. And that, you know, that amazing vocal performance, when you see Halford doing it in concert, it is like an athletic event, you know? Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, you get the albums after that where they're, they're kind of meandering a little bit, but as, as uh, um, Chris points out, Firepower, the recent Priest album, is really good. Um, and that's, that's interesting because, so we should talk a little bit about um, Priest songwriting. I think that'll be helpful in, in seeing where K.K. Downing is coming from. So er, early on, Judas Priest actually has a, a kind of similar history in its very beginning to the Scorpions, where none of the people who are currently listed as like original members of Judas Priest are actually original members of the original Judas Priest. Um, <clears throat> there, there was a band called Judas Priest fronted by Al Atkins, who was their, their singer, and K.K. Downing and Ian Hill and a couple other people were playing together. And that original Judas Priest broke up, just like the original Scorpions broke up. Um, and then Atkins um, and, and a couple others come over and they're like, uh, you know, let's uh, put together a band and they're, they're chit-chatting about it. Now, in his book, um, K.K. Downing says that it was his idea because he, are, he really loved that, that, that name, Judas Priest, to say, well, why don't we call this new band Judas Priest? And that's what they did. So the, the band that forms with Ian Hill and with K.K. Downing and Al Atkins and a few other people, that's the sort of second Judas Priest, just like with the Scorpions. Rudolf Schachner leaves the original band, which breaks up. He joins another band. He's the only guy coming in and, and he says, let's use this name Scorpions. So Judas Priest had some currency. And then... Um, you know, Al Atkins, I think this is kind of a famous story that a lot of people know. Um, it's sort of like the Paul Diano, uh, Bruce Dickinson thing, except that, you know, Al Atkins wasn't forced out. He quit. He's like, we're not making enough money. I got a wife and kids. See you later. I can't do this. And then that's when they recruit Rob Halford. Um, and it, one thing I think you can say about drummers and Judas Priest is drummers are important, but they, they're sort of like ACDC. They never really hold on to the same drummer all that long, <laughs> as opposed to guitarists and stuff like right. that. So now you got a four piece set and they're about to head into making their first album, rock a roll up. And, um, the management says, you know, maybe you should fill out the sound with another guitar. So they bring in Glenn Tipton. And he's viewed, he, I mean, he's always positioned by K.K. Downing in his book oops, who, as, as being sort of like, you know, a bit of an outsider and, you know, he wasn't the original guitarist and he also tries to take over and stuff like that. And some of that might be true and some of that might, might not be true. There's an awful lot of sniping going on in K.K. Downing's heavy duty days and, night, days and nights in Judas Priest at um, Glenn Tipton. And so they, they record the album and now they're Judas Priest, right? They have two guitarists, they have uh, Ian Hill, they have Rob Halford, um, and they're, they're you know, going around and doing all their, their sort of stuff. Now, who's writing the songs? Rob Halford is writing the lyrics. Makes perfect sense since he's the singer. Um, he's also doing a lot of the melodies because he's an incredible vocal talent. The rest of the songwriting is credited to the two guitarists, Glenn Tipton and K.K. Downing. And apparently there was bad blood early on because um, K.K. Downing felt that, you know, um, 
or yeah, that Tipton was was trying to like crimp his style and not let him solo enough in comparison to to uh, um, Glenn Tipton. But those are the the three main people writing. Ian Hill is contributing stuff, but he's not be getting credited. And the drummers are basically just drumming, you know. Um, getting replaced every so often, um, sort of like, you know, um, I don't know, the drummers are sort of like a, a spare tire or something, you could say. <laughs> now, once K.K. Downing leaves, who is doing the songwriting? Is it just um, Rob Halford and Glenn Tipton? No, Richie Faulkner is assuming a absolutely central role. And that's why the Priest albums after that Epitaph tour, like Firepower, sound the way that they do. So, you know, you could think about, well, what would it be like if it was K.K. Downing and Richie Faulkner and um, uh, uh, not Ian Hill, um, Rob Halford, you know, doing it in the present. And, and we're never going to find that out because, you know, K.K. Downing isn't being asked back. And Glenn Tipton is still writing for Judas Priest. Even though he's not touring because he has Parkinson's disease, he is still uh, an integral part of the writing process. So uh, this is, I think, very important back uh, story because a lot of, you know, a lot of the charges being made have to do with who's doing the writing and who gets credited and, you know, who's determining which direction Priest is going. Glenn Tipton has a tendency to say that, like, everything that went wrong in the directions that Priest took, that's the other guys, especially, or I mean, K.K. Downing has, says, says it's them, especially, you know, uh, Rob Halford and Glenn Tipton. Um, he doesn't, I don't see an awful lot of him saying, yeah, I screwed up here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, you know, and that's, that's interesting. Um, that, that doesn't strengthen his argument. That's maybe while we're a little, well, maybe that's true. Maybe it's not true. Yeah. To, to show no accountability is a uh, weakened well, that, argument. Now you bring up something really interesting. Does K.K. Downing have an, a single argument? Or is he just like, reacting to things and doing the proverbial throw shit at the wall and see what sticks or is it something in between in your view if there is a single argument i would love to hear what it is because i look at all the things that he's saying right and, and i'm a little bit confused <laughs> well you know i i mean there's things i guess i would focus in on like okay he's certainly an original member um yeah his one point about you know, uh, he didn't do the farewell tour in that article, he said, right? He, no, no. Yeah, he, he quit before that. Quit before that. So, and, you know, he kind of has a good point because the band didn't end up going into retirement, you know? Yeah. So maybe he would have, you know, uh, I, they asked him to do it and he didn't want to do it. So um, I think that's right. They gave him a, a crack at it, but he just, he quit. He didn't want to do it. He, according to him he wanted to do what originally became the playlist for the epitaph tour like a chronological thing which was amazing to see by the way sure because you know you had rob halford up on stage sort of explaining and then we did this and then we did this and here's where we transitioned this way and by the way you might like this or you might not like this you know here's right. turbo <laughs> you know? um yeah he wanted according to him that's what he wanted to do um the band's management wanted them to do a um an ep uh rather than an lp before the tour right. like, that's a terrible going. idea yeah. yeah um but it seems like a lot of the friction was already going on before that and that was sort of like the straw that broke the camel's back kind of thing yeah, I mean, I just feel like uh, you make a great point that he's very scattered, and I do get this idea of he's going to throw everything against the wall to see what sticks. But you you mentioned really in passing something really interesting that you know, like you know, my version of Priest is going to be the next big thing. It's like, well, wait a minute. Do you want your if your band's going to be the next big thing? Why do you want back with Priest? Yeah, or, there seems to I be mean, a contradiction there, right? Yeah, I think I think. I think you've kind of nailed it from my perspective as far as reading just the article you sent. And then, you know, like a lot of the stuff you told me about the book, yeah. um, it seems reactionary. It's kind of like maybe it was well, only at the beginning. He said, I went back in and they said no. And then it just turns into complete reaction. 
which does yeah. I, which I don't think is helping his case. I don't know what you think. It's just so that's that's interesting because we could compare it to somebody else um, who's you know very famously exited a band. Actually, two interesting people who exited bands, and then it turned out to be a really great thing. Um, so the earliest one that I'm thinking about is, um, Lemmy getting kicked out of Hawkwind, right? Lemmy oh, right. was really integral to Hawkwind. He actually switched from playing guitar to playing bass. And that's where he kind of formed his bass consciousness, you could say. And those albums that he's on, it's really, he's really central to it. And I guess he was kind of an important part of the stage presence. Then he gets kicked out on the tour. He doesn't really fit into Hawkwind, you could say, in terms of like look and ethos and all that. And then he goes on to form Motorhead and, th you know, wow, awesome that he did that, right? Another oh, case where maybe resentment played a, I, I mean, it's not, it's not clear that Lemmy was all that resentful. He's like, oh, I'm going to like, you know, show them up. But somebody who definitely was going to show them up, Dave Mustaine. Oh, right? that's a classic one. Yeah. And again, great that he did because. Right. I mean, I'm going to lay my cards on the table here. If you were to ask me before Cliff Burton died, which is the better thrash band, Metallica or Megadeth? I would have said, well, it's close, but I would say Metallica. And if you were to ask me, you know, four years later, which is the, the next, which is the best one? I would say Megadeth. Yeah, I agree. I, I you know, um, there was something to Cliff's, Contra, contribution as far as um attitude yeah and you know i think that one of the things i wonder a lot is when people die early or young you know well they were just getting started with their voice and craft so it would have been interesting to hear what metallica would have continued yeah. on because he was he was he was very important to their sound and we've talked about this in the past and i think the band dynamics as well um i I think, I mean, it's very clear that the, that Jason Newsted was treated like sort of a second class citizen right. by Ulrich and, and Hetfield. And I know, I know we're getting in the weeds a little bit here, but I think we can, we can bring this back and talk about Priest and, you know, Tim Ripper Owens and how he was treated maybe, um, which doesn't seem to be that great, you know, and, and this sort of thing goes on in bands, you know, um, Ian Gillen talks about this in Deep Purple that, that he felt that he was never really treated like a full member of the band because he wasn't an original member of the band, you know um yeah. so jason newstead coming in he he couldn't present the sort of like hold on guys uh, do we really want to go in that direction that that a cliff burton could you know well this is this is important to talk about because this is part of you know we're talking about people's role in the mm. band and we you know we're drawing comparisons to these other people and we could bring it back to kk about yeah. how what he contributed well the songwriting you know, I'd, be, I'd like to know, like, for example, who came up, which one of them came up with the heads are going to roll riff, that intro riff, which is so iconic. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that intro, I remember the first time I heard that when the <laughs> album came out, it just, I, I, it was in my head all day and I, they didn't announce who the band was, but it ended up being on the radio. Yeah. Um, and and um, I wonder who wrote that riff because, you know, some of the riffs are fantastic. Was it all KK? Was it, did they... You know, I don't know. Yeah, so, I mean, what I get, and this is mostly coming from Downing's book, Heavy Duty Days and Nights and, and Judas Priest, is that he and, I mean, they would have these sessions, right, and play together. And uh, <clears throat> so obviously the drummer and the bassist are still part of that, that process as well. And they would do a lot of, you know, you know noodling and, and playing around with riffs and putting things together and kk talks much more about the solos than he does about the riffs because he's really pissed off about glenn tipton according to kk downing um hogging the spotlight shortening the solos that that downing was supposed to do or giving giving downing less solos mm -hmm. and and you can say that well how did he give you less? Right. I mean, I, weren't you there in the room, you know, and, and his presentation, I mean, he says it over and over again in the book. It's like, you know, Downing just had a way of getting people to, uh, well, here, so here's, here's a good example, right? Um, 
it had become apparent that because I generously let Glenn in on the first album, most of which Al Atkins and I had written, the songwriting was eventually going to become a three-way split among Rob, Glenn, and I. I just thought that if we agreed to evenly split the songwriting duties, that would in turn guarantee the financial side of things going forward. Nobody could argue with that logic. It meant that hopefully the best ideas would always rise to the top. I just didn't want weaknesses to start creeping in. And then he says, however, now this is a long time ago, on sad wings of destiny, I started to find myself in a position where I'd be coming to the table with what I thought were solid ideas, only to have them rejected and replaced with something of Glenn's instead. At the time, I thought, I'm totally pissed off with this. At the time, what I actually said was, okay, then. Um, and here he has something quite, quite interesting. This is talking about um, sin after sin. Speaking of weaknesses, I thought Last Rose of Summer was exactly that. Now, now, we love that song. I know. And when you read Rob Halford's book, you get a very different, well, it's not showing up on here. You get a very different take on that, right? This is Halford and with that and Raw Deal. This is Halford coming out to his bandmates. You know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, he says, um, it, seemed, it felt to me that Glenn and Rob were on the Queen band, bandwagon. So Glenn had this idea to compose a ballad type song on the piano, knowing full well if he could carve out something to take to Rob, Rob would probably jump on it because ballads often appeal to singers. And um, he also didn't like them doing uh, Diamonds and Rust, you know? Oh. So, there, so I think there's, I mean, there's definitely like, divergences in the musical sensibilities going on, right? Now, to what degree was it um, Glenn Tipton really steamrollering and, you know, Machiavellian manipulation of the band to get his stuff forward and, and downplay KK's? I mean, that's tough to tell, right? We weren't there. You weren't there. Yeah. And you don't see anything like that happening in Rob Halford's account. And Ian Hill has never said anything like that. So I'm inclined to, to view it as hyperbole. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so interesting that those songs were uh, picked out because we, when we did that show, we talked about, we talked about that ballad and yeah. how we all really thought it was fantastic. And um, so he thought that was a mistake. <laughs> well, I mean, um, I don't know. I mean, that, that is that usually that's what happened, like with the Go-Go's, their first album. What's her name? Jane Wielden. Was it Jane? No, it was it was one of the yeah. guitars wrote all the songs. And so she got rich yeah. and the other people. And then the next album, they're like, you're only allowed one song to write because we're going to write and make some money. <laughs> and her song was Vacation, which went number one. <laughs> And so, so, but what Van yeah. Halen did was they put everybody down. So everybody got paid. I mean, I do agree yeah. with that, you know, so there's not financial resentment. So um, you could still have resentment about your musical ideas, not being that's right. paid attention to. I mean, I think the dominant theme of KK's musical ideas is I want things to sound more like breaking the law or uh, hell bent for leather or, um, the Sentinel, he's actually got a song referencing the Sentinel on his new album, you know, um, so I think he, he really favored the heavy side and he didn't like the <clears throat> more, more either proggy or, or ballady sort of stuff. Um, so I, I would imagine, although he doesn't say this, that if you think about hell, um, not help out for leather screaming for vengeance, you think about the song fever, which I think is an amazing song on there, but it's a ballad. I don't, I think he probably didn't like that as much, you know? That's interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, when the band's going in a different direction. Uh... Yeah. Well, and this is another thing that, you know, we still haven't jumped into all the ethical issues, but maybe this is, this is something good to think about. Would Priest's catalog be strengthened or weakened by having a, let's call it a, 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 still a wide, but a narrower heavy metal. Like it, this is all clearly identifiable as heavy metal kind of sound, or are they better off having um, songs where, you know, there's more, there's more playing around with it. Like think about 
the first part of the rage, right? Starts out with that awesome bass solo. It's kind of slow moving or dying to meet you, you know? Uh, also starts out with a great bass line and it's kind of soft at the beginning. And then it goes into, you know, the, the heavier stuff later or diamonds and rust or right. um, off of, you know, one of the things that people complained about, believe it or not, on Defenders of the Faith is uh, when night comes down, people are like, this doesn't sound like a Judas Priest song, you know? And you're like, well, okay, maybe, maybe it doesn't sound like a usual Judas Priest song. It's not breaking right. the law but it's still a great song and it fills out, it fills out the, um, what would you call it? It doesn't just fill out a catalog. A catalog is just a listing. It fills out the musical space of the band, mm. you know? Yeah, no, I, yeah. I mean, it's kind of, if you put an album on, there's got, well, it's, it's like picking a set list. Even if you're a metal band mm. there, there, it can't be here the whole time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, I mean, I, I suppose with thrash bands, maybe, but, you know, an audience needs this kind of thing where, you know, the, the, and an album, I think in the same way, I, you know, okay. for it to all be breaking the laws, I mean, I, you know, it, I don't know, I just, uh, maybe that's one of the things that made them great is, is it wasn't the same. Uh, I don't oh. agree with that. Oh, this is an interesting point that Mark is making. What, what do you think of this, Scott? Priest wouldn't be priest without Downing, and it wouldn't be priest if it was only Downing. Well, that's what we're talking about, right? So, you know, Judas Priest, uh, K.K. Downing's Judas Priest, we're not going to call that Judas Priest, really, right? I think this is more about the, the writing up until 2011. Mark is saying something like Judas Priest really wouldn't be the Judas Priest sound without KK Downing in those important right. formative years. I think that's probably right. I agree. Um, but it wouldn't be Priest if, if, if Downing like dominated the songwriting process. Well, that's true because you know, you're missing um, Glenn. T well, is Glenn writing still, you said? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and who knows, you know, you know, uh, people write in different eras, you know, uh, kind of like when somebody's like, well, why didn't, why isn't Robert Plant doing Led Zeppelin stuff? Well, because he's in a different part of his life and he wouldn't be writing, you know, uh, he wouldn't be writing early Zeppelin stuff because he's not a, an 18 year old in the 60s, yeah. you know? Uh, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, so it's time and place as well, you know? Um, and Priest is still iconic. I mean, Halford and, you know, we, you and I saw him a few years ago and it was unbelievable. Yeah. You know, um, I have to say, too, that <clears throat> watching them on stage, I, I've gotten to see them um, both with Glenn Tipton and Richie Faulkner. Right. So. Right. Old classic guitarist, new new guy on the scene and also with the two young guys, Richie Faulkner and Andy Sneed. And um, I thought they did a great job. And. You know, they, they, they do kind of, I mean, Richie Faulkner is not just a, a K.K. Downing clone, although K.K. Downing <laughs> accused him of being such. Um, oh, he really when, did? Yeah, when he, when, he, when he first got hired. And um, that's sour grapes. That's, I'm sorry, that's just. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay, go on. I didn't mean to interrupt. But that's no, no. I, I, and I thought they did. It, it, it was really it made sense. It, it was identifiably Judas Priest. Um, I think that these are these are musicians who came up on Priest. Um, there's a 30 year difference between yeah. Richie Faulkner and KK um, um, Downing, but maybe that's enough to actually like help in a way. You know, it, it, it maybe it's better to bring in somebody who's been, you know, nourished on on that stuff and can step in rather than somebody who's closer in time. You know. Well, that's true. And I think, you know, I was really, really impressed with, with Richie live. Like when I got to see him, he's a great performer. He looks cool. He looks, the he doesn't look out of place. He's, you know, and his playing's great. I do, I, I do take, you know, um, you know, KK taking a shot at this guy um, in any ways is just inappropriate. That's not professional. That's uh, that sounds like bitterness. That sounds like, I mean, it's just spite at that point, right? He's angry, so he's going to... 
Well, um, I mean, on the one hand, so it, it's clear that there were things <clears throat> that we weren't being told about the 2011 de downing departure, right? And it looks like he had a lot of resentments going back a long ways and we don't we don't really know what what's true in this this account maybe maybe uh he was pushed to the side in some of the songwriting stuff um and, and maybe he has some legitimate beefs but he didn't handle them well um i mean if you look at richie faulkner and kk downing you could see how somebody who is kk downing could say what the hell, man? They just got this guy who plays with a similar guitar to me and has a similar look. And what's what's going on here? <laughs> you know, I mean, I know, but it's not. Um, I mean, the poor, you know, uh, the poor guy replacing him. I mean, he doesn't mean re disrespect to KK. He's got his dream gig. Yeah, yeah. You know, being raised on that, and um, I, yeah, I, I, I understand. I kind of understand that, but um, that's besides the point because, uh. He's, he'd have to, have to be replaced by somebody because he quit. Yeah. You know, well, so it's interesting too. So we still haven't gotten into a lot of the ethical issues that we wanted to explore. We've been kind of noodling around, you might say, but since we're talking about Richie Faulkner, um, his, his contribution to the like stuff out there in the media has been to say, you guys really need to put this feud behind you. You know, so here's an example. This is from Classic Rock. Richie Faulkner urges KK Downing and Judas Priest to end their shit show feud. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, and, and this this is summarizing a different interview that was done. He says uh, the whole situation with him and the band over the last ten years to me has been totally unnecessary. It's been a bit of a shit show, and I don't know why that is. To me. Music aside, they should maybe pick up the phone, just talk to each other's buddies and go and have a beer and just be pals. You know, screw music for a minute. Let's just be pals. And then whatever happens, happens. They were pals for 40 years. They yeah. lived pretty much together for 40 years, four decades. And then he says, I wish it was different. All that weirdness of the last 10 years didn't need to happen. If they'd parted on good terms, maybe things would be different now. But unfortunately, that, that didn't happen. And I think that's, you know, smart take. You know? Yeah, no, yeah, that is. I mean, <clears throat> you, you're talking about somebody that's involved with the project, but wasn't involved with the drama per se. Like, you know, he doesn't have a beef with anybody. Um, you could say he he was a pretext for drama, but not not instigating the drama. Well, if it wasn't him, it would be someone else. I mean, it's he, him. Just you know, somebody had to be hired when KK quit. I mean, that's right. it. You know, so if it wasn't him. It would be someone else. And, you unless, know. unless Judas Priest had toured as a four piece. And this is an additional part of the drama. <laughs> so uh, Judas Priest floated the idea of being a, um, a quartet. And it turns out that Rob Halford actually said, well, this is my idea. Uh, another funny interview, I read about it. Uh, Biff Byford of Saxon was asked about this. And he said, I think they must have been drunk at the time when they made this decision. Because how are you, how are you actually going to do Judas Priest as a four piece? And Richie Faulkner said, you know, I think I could probably pull it off. It's going to take some like rethinking how to do this. But I, I, I guess I could do it. And then, you know, the question that you got to ask is, well, why why shut out this guy, Andy Sneap, who has, you know, produced their latest albums like Firepower, who knows their whole catalog, who's a good guitarist. Um, and the idea, I think, was to create more space for Glenn Tipton to like, you know, show up on, on stage every once in a while. But that that's not a, a good reasoning for it. And then Judas Priest actually reversed their decision to remove uh, Andy Sneap from the live lineup. Now they're, they're going to tour as a five piece. K.K. Downing could not resist the opportunity to, to complain about this. He said, you know, a four-piece Judas Priest is a slap in the face. That's the, the title of uh, one interview. And now here's where we get to this inconsistency thing again. So I'm going to read a little bit of this. Former Judas Priest guitarist K.K. Downing con considers it insulting that his former bandmates even briefly considered touring with a four-piece lineup. Um, 
like he says, I'm like everybody else. I'm totally bemused. It was so extreme and insulting in a way, I guess, and insulting to Glenn as well. It was kind of a slap in the face saying, okay, you two guys did it, but we think one, just one guy can do it. It kind of made us and everything we've done and created seem superfluous, really. I'm sure Glenn will agree with me that it does have a value. There must be something behind the scenes that we don't know. So this to me seems like, like crap stirring, you know? Um, if he, if he thinks that, you know, Glenn Tipton's ideas aren't really that valuable, why is he bringing him in as a, and trying to put words in his mouth, you That's, know, yeah. it seems like this created an opportunity for KK Downing to have something yet again, bad to say about, about Priest. And it might be just opportunistic. He might be, well, I've got this new band. We need some publicity. This will bring it, you know. Well, that's, you know, that's true because as you said that you've seen on the boards, there's been kind of a split. Yeah. You're like, you know, th their team KK or their team priest or, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess at this point I'm confused uh, because if he wanted back in the band, talking smack about the band nonstop is not going to help that help him join the band <laughs> it's a strange you know, strategy right <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a, maybe some a new strategy we don't know about but um yeah i'm you know with all the complaining and is he trying to make his band the next big thing i mean good luck i mean you know without halford it's well it's kind of like when iron maiden who, who, who's the guy um in blaze, the blaze blaze uh bailey i think yep. yeah yeah, yeah. And so that was a tough sell because they also had, they also had Yannick as a, as the new guitarist then. So oh, the, replacing uh, Adrian Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Adrian left. And um, that, that was, those were tough. That was a tough sell. So um, we talked a bit, a bit about key players, yeah. you know, and you, know, you can't have Iron Maiden without uh, Steve Harris. You can't, I mean, that yeah. was just, uh, but you know, can you have priest without KK? I mean, it's a classic lineup. We grew up with it as yeah. fans. We dig it. Of course, in a perfect world, that would be the band, yeah. but you know, things come up, but um, you yeah. know, that's actually a really great point uh, in a perfect world. Yeah. All of these bands that we loved at a particular time would retain exactly the same players and they just keep churning out music. That sounds like that. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and there's two things that were kind of missing in that one is that all of these guys are getting older just yeah. as we are. And so there is no way to like hold together. I mean, think about the Scorpions, right? So the Scorpions still have a fairly classic lineup with Klaus Meine, uh, Rudy, Rudy Schenker. Um, I mean, they don't have, they don't have their original drummer. Um, I think Francis Bucholtz, is he still with them or did he quit as their bassist? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure of the current lineup. Matthias uh, is still in. Yeah, I mean, Matthias Jobs is, is he's not the original guitarist, but neither was Uli no. von Roth. And so he's been with them long enough that I think we can say there's a stable lineup. But I mean, how long can that last? Those guys are getting pretty old. We can't expect that they are somehow just going to like say, well, I'm never going to retire. The fans get to decide. <laughs> I mean, this kind of goes to that, that, that like thing that you're talking about, the it's not a contract. It's like a, a set of assumptions between uh, fans and audience and the musicians themselves. And we also ignore the fact that maybe the musicians do in fact want to leave. Maybe, you know, KK Downing, he gets to say, I'm going to take off. I mean, he points out that Rob Halford, you know, decided to leave the band for a while yeah, and, and do his own things. Right. And he says, now, this is kind of a legitimate point that swings us back into the ethical questions. K.K. Downing, one of the key things that he says that I think we really should consider. So you were willing to let Rob Halford leave the band and then come back when he asked to do so. Why the hell aren't you doing that for me? That's actually that's now that's a good point. That's a really so good. So you point. think there's something to that? I mean, you know, but the problem is he dilutes it with all the other stuff. Okay. If he, if he pick, if he were to pick and choose good points. Okay. That's an, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I think. Um, I think if you're on one hand making a good point and then you say something um, malicious or you you know, uh, you complain um, yeah. that under, I just, I just feel like, especially when you sent that article, I just feel like he was, 
he was undermining his own arguments. He has some legitimate things. I mean, so he's really making too many arguments, right? Yeah, but in like you said, it's kind of all over the place. Like you know, go back to the th- throwing the spaghetti to wall and something will, stick, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, that's actually a really good point. So when Halford want to come back, that was good. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you were to stick to points like that, they do make sense. Um, you know, and you know, being one of the writers, um, so he's obviously has an important role in the sound. Mm-hmm um of, of the priest sound you know and um of course his plane you know you would recognize his plane um but i just you know that's an that's an interesting ethical point it's kind of i don't yeah. know all that you know um here's here's a great uh point by by mark um we'll, we'll come back to other ethical arguments and points but going back to the thing that we were just talking about with um you know, is it reasonable for us, the fans, to expect the band to remain the same? I sometimes wonder if part of the problem, and this is something you've touched on a lot before in the past, Scott, isn't that most of these guys never expected to do this whole rock star thing for so long. Lots of issues have cropped up that are kind of unprecedented within the heavy metal world. How do, a uh, good question. So I want to hear your take on this. How do other music professionals outside of metal handle aging in their career? How do they adjust their lives to accommodate these changes? That's a really great point. Um, so I think you know, part of the thing that we've talked about before is you take a band like Priest, and there's not a lot of people that like you know I, I brought up Robert Plant that completely sounds different now, but yeah, and people are like why aren't you doing the Zeppelin stuff? Because I can't, and that's an interesting thing. So um, I've gone through my own phases where. In my 20s, I would just play any gig. I didn't care what it was. I'd get in a <laughs> van with no heat. And um, and then as I got older, I said, well, maybe I should be a little more selective. Did you ever did you ever play in like a cage like the Blues Brothers where they throw the bottles and stuff? <laughs> um, no, actually, I didn't. But I played a lot of interesting stuff. I related. Yeah. <laughs> Being at the wrong bar, you know, yeah. having that. Um, so I think... Mark, you raise, raise a great point because I have the luxury of like waking up one day and going, I'm not going to play corporate events anymore because, you know, the corporate events events play really uh, pay really well, but you're treated like dirt and it's, you know, and it's too much drama and it sucks to your soul. And I want to do this now. And then I'm deciding to compose differently, or whatever. However, if you're in like a band like Priest. Yeah. Where yeah. there's, where there's a logo and a history and. and- yeah. And you don't, you know, uh, you know, say you don't, it's not in you anymore, like when you were 20. Or, yeah, and like a lot of these bands, they ask, it's like, you know, we thought this could be a five year run. We didn't know we'd be doing this for 40 years or whatever. Yeah. You know, and like, look at the Rolling Stones. It's like, you know, did they, they must still enjoy it because they still tour and I'm sure they have enough money. But um, I have a certain luxury in my music career to change as I age. And, um, but you know, I don't have a, a crazy fan base like priest and, you know, they're expected to go out and kill a show and, um, the aging thing, you know, it's like, well, maybe they can't do the road as long, you know, where I remember when Bon Jovi's Sliver and wet, wet came out, they, what they tour that for two years. It was such a big album. Yeah. And um, by the time I saw Bon Jovi on that tour, like John had no voice left. And um, so I think that's a really cool thing because we become different people um, and maybe people within the band are uh, growing into different people and they're not, it's not the same family that it was when it was the eighties, you know? Um, and, you know, th- th- you know, maybe they didn't assume that these kind of problems would ever come up. They didn't think about this when the, first few albums came out or whatever they didn't think um they didn't have to deal with stuff it's like any relationship i guess um you know you test a relationship when somebody goes through a hard time or whatever and how how the relationship responds to that and i guess age age and maturity and everything has to all play into it but they don't have the luxury uh so i could you know well some people have um you know, they'll say, I, you know, I don't want to do the road anymore. I want to stay home with my family, but then they're out. Well, you know, and that was something that was a bone of contention with uh, um, KK Downing and Glenn Tipton. 
um, Glenn Tipton got married to one of the managers and, and, oh. and, you know, they, they had like a home life together and this comes up, uh, in, in the, somewhere in the eighties in, 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 uh, Tipton's book. And he says, um, you know, we were like, why aren't we going on the road? And, and Glenn Tipton was the, the obstacle to that, according to, to KK Downing again, not not quite sure how true that is you know it seems like there were other other issues within the band as well um i mean it's interesting too cuz ian hill are you know another one of the early uh members or ostensibly an original member who's never left the band you know like a good bassist has been like the rock that that has held things together and um he and, and Glenn Tipton, you know, knew each other actually before they got in the band. And um, Ian Hills also was, was married to Rob Halford's uh, sister for, for some time. And, and you know, uh, Downing is also mad at, at um, Ian Hill in part because Ian Hill has said, listen, we're not, we're not changing the lineup. Um, he ruled out... Um, downing joining priest on their on their 50 year tour saying i don't know where he was coming from with that comment i think he just played a bit of mischief to be honest i mean ken's place in the band has already been taken he's sitting right there you know he points at faulkner it's also two albums down the road since nostradamus which is the last one he played on is he going to be prepared to play music from the new album you know which he probably would not and on top of that he's going to have to learn glenn's parts too so right. it's all reasons why we didn't ask him to return. Apart from that, he's been retired for nearly eight years. So this is this strikes me as very reasonable. It's you know he's saying, uh, it, it, don't worry about who was an original member or you know who's who got to leave and come back. There's some real practicalities here. You know you, you don't like Glenn Tipton and yet you'd be playing his parts because Richie Faulkner is now playing your parts, and you didn't you didn't play on the firepower album. So you're going to, you're going to learn. I mean, actually, Scott, let me ask you as, as a musician who yeah. has done a lot of studio and gigging work, how hard would it be to like learn um, the whole Judas Priest firepower album riff by riff, lick by lick, solo by solo, so that you could go out on the road and do it, you know, um, for 40 shows. I don't, you know, I'll say for me, um, I would probably need 10 days to have it completely memorized and learned um, to show up to rehearse it. Okay. And then um, if we're going to do the whole album, I mean. Uh, yeah, that's 10 days just focusing on that task? Yeah. Like, so let's say I've never heard the album. Okay. And then somebody gives it, gives it to me. I would really go through it meticulously. First, I'd listen to it, listen to it. And then I'd transcribe the parts the tough the, the longest bit would be memorizing it for me okay. um, so but i don't know what set of skills kk actually has though like um that's been his career has been playing his own music and um my career has been learning uh entire sets for artists or rock bands as a side musician on stage like i talked about um i was called on a thursday at 3 p.m. a few years ago to sub for Skunk Baxter, uh, you know, from the Doobie Brothers and Steely Dan. And they, Barry Goodrow from the band Boston was in there, the drummer from James Brown. So they said they gave me four Steely Dan tunes to learn and memorize, four Boston tunes to learn and memorize, four James Brown and four um, uh, Bob Marley tunes, and then wow. two Doobie Brothers songs. So That's I, 18 songs total. Yeah. And, you know, Steely Dan is not the easiest stuff. Um, plus, I wanted to learn Skunk Baxter's solos note for note out of respect to him. And I did that in under 12 hours. I mean, I had to pull all nighter in the hotel. I had to be ready for sound check next at 11. But that's just that's just a skill you gain when you practice ear training, when you practice. Yeah. And but, you know, no disrespect to KK, but that his 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 life, uh, his his position as a musician was never that working musician thing. It was always, you know, we're gonna get together, we're gonna write this album. So, you know, it is a question whether he'd be capable, you know, depending on how 
difficult the guitar solos are, you know, or how difficult or if, how he is at lifting songs off albums. So I, I can't speak for him, but yeah, I mean, it, it seems perfectly reasonable that he could, you know, um, but it might be a longer learning curve than like, like it might be a longer that. learning curve. Yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, I always, you know, if, if it's going to be something involved and I've never heard it, it's good. The memorization part is going to be the, the hard part. So he'd have to, you know, listen to the album a lot. He'd have to, whatever he'd have to do. I mean, I think he could do it, but I think the most uncomfortable part of what you just said was he'd be playing Glenn Tipton's parts. Although yeah. couldn't we, couldn't he go back to being KK and making Richie do the Glenn Tipton parts? I wonder. I mean, it sounds like Richie Faulkner probably could do that, but here's, here's, we actually, this is a great jumping off point, right? So Rob has his finger right on things. It seems like KK thinks he has some sort of right to come back that he's being denied. What sort of thing might ground such a right? Are there other sorts of associations or groups that might be a useful analogy? <clears throat> and, you know, um, being able to step back into your old shoes as if you hadn't left 10 years before, that's, that's a big ask. And, and I think that KK Downing does view himself as entitled in some way to this. So this is something we should talk about. We've, we've talked about the, hey, Rob Halford got to do it. Why can't I do it? And, you know, you could say, well, you know, they don't, they don't sing the, the Ripper Owens stuff, right? As a matter of fact, uh, there's, a tiff, there's a tiff going on right now about whether um, they're even going to have that stuff available on Apple Music or not um wow so it's, so it's not quite the same i i think another thing that that tipton keeps bringing up that he must think entitles him to it is i was one of the original members you know um uh ian hill and me are the only original members of judas priest left you know rob halford came in later glenn tipton came in later the many drummers have come and gone i'm not even going to talk about them so therefore I have a greater claim because I was, you know, there at the beginning. And I mean, it would be, it'd be kind of weird, right? Because it would be sort of like if Gary Moore had said that about Thin Lizzy, you know, get rid of these, these guys, you know, Scott Gorham and Brian Robertson. I want to come back, you know? That's an interesting point. Uh, they, yeah. they, they had a lot of, you know, John Sykes was in Thin Lizzy. Um, right, right. Oh, that's an interesting point um yeah but it does does were... does being part of the original configuration give you greater greater rights in some way or entitle I mean, you to consideration that other people wouldn't have i mean i think I'm... so i mean i i guess i mean it doesn't mean it's a hard yes it just means you know that's that would be part of his good argument <laughs> let's i mean let's follow that logic out with some other bands so if um if michael Schechner quit being a jerk to his older brother and saying disparaging things about him and said, I want to rejoin the Scorpions. Um, you should, you know, send, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we'll also keep uh, Matthias jobs or maybe Matthias jobs needs to retire. I should, I should get to do that. Would we, would we give him any, uh, you know, would we say that's plausible at all? I don't think so. Was Michael even an original member, though? Yeah, I mean, on he... Lonesome Crow. Oh, was okay. He? Yeah, you're probably right. Um, or was or was he? Maybe I'm wrong about that. Because um, there was uh, Uli. Well, he got stolen away from the Scorpions by UFO. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but it's it's very early on in the band's trajectory. You know. Right. I'm trying to think. I mean, that that, that almost. That's you know, like it, it, more thing. <clears throat> Here's a good example. When Iron Maiden, when, when Bruce Dickinson left Iron Maiden, yeah. um, if Paul Diano had said, hey, guys, I'm ready to patch it up. You bring me back. I don't think the rest of the band, I mean, Steve Harris definitely wouldn't have said, yeah, welcome back. Great to have you as the original singer. And said they got Blaze Bailey, right? So that's, that's a great point. Although the thing that happened with Iron Maiden is, when they got Bruce Dickinson, they really took off. And you yeah. know, most fans, it's actually starts with Bruce Dickinson, which is, uh, but you know, it's interesting. A lot of the people, if you take, um, take, take Iron Maiden when Adrian Smith was ready to come back, 
they kept Jan's. Yeah. Uh, Yannick, rather. They yeah. kept Yannick. So it's a three guitar band. I thought that was silly, but I think that was probably good. You know, it was probably an ethical thing to do since, you know, Yannick put his hours in. And I remember. Well, then what if we apply that to Tim Ripper Owens? You know, I mean, he could have been a backup singer or something. Instead, they're like, well, Rob is in, you're out. See you later. <laughs> yeah, there's only room for one front man. But yeah. And I don't know if you, um, I know it's not metal, but um, if you know anything about REO Speedwagon, the original guitarist Gary was kicked out in 89 just because he couldn't, he just went off of the deep end with drugs and drinking. Oh, okay. And so if you ever saw Behind the Music, you know, the whole time Gary's like, I want to be back in the band, you know, and I, I want to be, you know, whatever. And, and they would Ooh. go back and forth a confessional and they said, well, you know, if he can clean up, we'll sit down with Dave Amato who replaced him and they would have been a two guitar Ario Speedwagon. Okay. You know? And so like, I always thought that was interesting. It's like, you know, you can't just, it's not nice to like hire someone, bring them in the band. They write a bunch of albums, go, eh, the original guy wants to come back. You got to leave now. Yeah. I mean, there is something so they they talk, they always with guitarists talk about adding on like maybe it would be a third guitarist and which might be silly but Maiden did it yeah so Chris brings up Chris Squire of yes I mean what do you think about that Chris Squire but he's dead now well so yeah he can't rejoin anything <laughs> he can join the bands in the sky you know? right um, <laughs> Chris Squire wow miss him. There's I mean, no if, you, if you think about how many musicians have died, this is a total side note. And imagine that they all go to some place, whether heaven yeah. or hell or, you know, musician Valhalla. <laughs> imagine some of the, and they have equipment. Imagine some of the sessions that would be going on down there. You know, like you could have uh, Lemmy playing with Dio, you know. Jimi Hendrix. And they have pick a whole bunch of people. Yeah. <laughs> the best gigs happening right now. We might have Mozart composing for metal bands. <laughs> yeah. So Mark, uh, Mark and Chris both have. Uh, uh, oh, so he's saying about Chris Choir veto over yes members. Mark also says if Downing is a founder of Priest, oh, I oh, guess his sorry. claim to legitimacy might depend on. So this is a good point. The extent to which Priest adhered to and flourished under his founding vision. I mean, I don't know that we can say that he had a founding vision. It would be sort of like uh his dimension of the founding sound of of priest right um but yeah what what, what, did, you, what did you want to say about the the chris squire part oh that i i misinterpreted uh v to over yes members got it chris yeah oh no i was going to say um something to mark's point while you were talking uh then i I forgot his his role in the 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 Judas Priest sound, you know, and ethos. Um, well, I was going to make the point that you, you, in 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 with this, um, what you just read that Halford said something that I didn't address. Um, did KK down? Well, I guess he's he's been busy with his other projects, so he's kept his playing up. Yeah, right? he so, he has, and he's he's also played at festivals and things like that i mean that's how he i think got the idea to put together kk's priest which, which and so he's still doing priest that. songs right yeah and you know actually kk's priest at kk's i forget the name of the the bar uh slash concert venue that he put together is it the grindhouse or something like that i i did find a set list and it's all priest songs but then they just recently did a, an album and they've got what was it like 10 or 11 tracks of their own and they're they're we'll talk about that in a bit i think it's a good album not a great album okay. um but but i might be wrong about that so rob says here's the analogy let's say i found a nonprofit to help homeless kids and then decide to leave and say all sorts of garbage about everybody else involved <laughs> on the way out. later on i decide i want to come back do i have the right to doesn't seem so to me but are bands importantly different in some way so, I, I mean, I do think this goes to Mark's point. Um, yeah. Maybe some original members of bands don't really contribute that much or they're, they're left behind, like Paul Diano, right? So once you replace Paul Diano with Bruce Dickinson, 
the Iron Maiden stuff that Paul Diano had a hand in, it, it's changed. You know, Bruce Dickinson singing Running Free is better, I would say, objectively than Paul Diano singing Running Free, you know, and it's, it is still identifiably, identifiably Iron Maiden. Um, some original members don't really contribute that much. I mean, I would say like some are absolutely central. So think about Thin Lizzy. Why does the Scott Gorham version of Thin Lizzy not produce new music because it would be wrong to, they think. There's an ethical argument to do so after Phil Lynott, who was so absolutely central as both bassist and singer and frontman. And um, writer. Died, yeah, yeah. So it, that, yeah. that's like an extreme case, right? Um, yeah, it was Thin Lizzy was pretty much Phil. Yeah. It, with, a, with a backup band. I mean, well, I mean, when you've got Gary Moore playing for you, oh, Gary yeah. Moore's, you oh, know, yeah. and, and Brian Robertson and Scott Gorham, you know, they're pretty important. Oh, right? they're important. I guess what I mean is he was the face of the band. Yeah. And he always had like, you know, John Sykes is no joke. Uh, Gary yeah. Moore one of the greatest. Um, and I just think that. But, but nobody really says like, oh, man, I was a drummer for Thin Lizzy. And you're like, oh. <laughs> Drumming for Thin Lizzy. <laughs> yeah, right. I guess, yeah. Um, but, that you know, that's one of those things the band can't go on without Phil. Yeah. But, I mean, they, they do, and I think they're doing a smart thing. Like, you can't start writing Thin Lizzy albums if you don't have, you know, uh, Yeah. Phil. I mean, um, Iron Maiden without Steve Harris, is it Iron Maiden? No, no, not to me. I don't, yeah. think, I don't think they'd be selling tickets if he wasn't in the band. And... You know, he's one of the heavy writers. Yeah. So that's at one extreme, right? And yeah. then we can say at another extreme, we have the people who they're there, but they're essentially, you know, just kind of floating. Um, they're not making any major contribution. It's, it's awesome that they're there and it's fun, but they're not, you know, they're not really doing something distinctive and they could be replaced. And I, I'm going to say, and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong on this. A lot of drummers kind of fit that bill fit the bill of replacing well, you could re you could replace them uh i'm not saying all of them but but a lot of them i think there's there's like a greater rep replaceability of drummers maybe than there is for like the key guitarist or well uh, the, the drum the drumming and the time feel in a rock band like for example there's no way you could have replaced john bonham in, okay yeah uh, I mean, he's one of the greatest of all time. And, you know, when they came out and Phil Collins is a great drummer, but when they did Live Aid with Phil Collins, it just wasn't Led Zeppelin. It well, wasn't. And let's think of some great drummers. Like, so Bill Ward, who is, you know, uh, yeah. for what he does, he's sort of like um, um, Clive Burr, kind of yeah. jazzy. There's, there's a lot of cool stuff going on. But you can replace in Black Sabbath, um, Bill Ward with Cozy Powell because Cozy Powell is good enough for that, right? Cozy Powell's a great, great, great. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But the, but the, but it's gonna the sound's gonna change though, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. Like um, what's a, what's another? I mean, like you know, like I said, Phil Collins is a great drummer, but was not John Bonham, and I'm not saying who's better. Yeah. Um, well, it's like, well, so maybe some of these people fit into that like middle third category. So I was going to say there's like the totally irreplaceable, there's right. the easily replaceable, and then you've got the people who are in the middle where they, they do contribute something. Is KK Downing, here's the key question then, is yeah. KK Downing somebody who was absolutely irreplaceable for the Judas Priest sound in their classic era. Like if we took him away and replaced him with Richie Faulkner, uh, you know, coming out of his, his mom's womb, grabbing a guitar or something like that, <laughs> could, or, or somebody else on the scene, could Judas Priest have made the kind of music that they did? Or is he more in the middle section where he's making some really solid contributions, but he's, he's not generating something that gives him like an automatic right to rejoin the band. Well, that's such a good question. I mean, for me, it would come down to how much he contributed in the writing because it's not clear. Okay. It's okay. not clear. I mean, if they're if they're saying we did it that way, so it would be fair, we'd all get paid. Like, you know, the heads are going to roll riff at the beginning. Um, which guitarist wrote that? You know, if, if KK was the one that was writing all those great riffs, yeah, he'd have a, he'd have a story. Well, I, I think they they alternated back and forth. So let's say we credit him with half of the great riffs, you know. So he was part of the sound. I, I'd say the, the thing is, um, as far as a player, um, 
easily replaceable as far as like uh this the sound i mean okay uh, and I'm, I'm taking everything else off the table it's just kind of like like let's pretend that he got really sick and they needed a guitar player to come in but yeah it would, it wouldn't be hard to find somebody to fill those gigs and although the audience might want their money back because see, people do go to buy the ticket to see maybe their favorite band member or whatever it's yeah well, so like you know it's, it's like the, the when you go to the plays the the lead role of so-and-so will be uh played by the understudy today oh no i came to see you know <laughs> yeah you know it's kind of funny with judas priest um i you know i, lo I love the band yeah. i'm there to see ian hill I actually cool. I, I actually wrote ian hill a fan letter i don't write a lot of fan letters i wrote him a fan letter a couple of years back and sent it oh. off i never got a response but he's he's such a you know i, I mean I used to play bass. Um, I'm always listening for the bass going on. Yeah. He he made so many awesome contributions. I think he's kind of underrated as a, a bass player. You know, he's not like Steve Harris great, right. um, but he's certainly he's certainly uh, Blackie Lawless great. You know, maybe beyond him. Um, you know, Dave Ellison uh, great. You know. Um, yeah, he is Mark, a solid Mark, player. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, yeah. And and he That's, does some really cool jazzy stuff on the earlier albums. I, I you know, I mentioned the rage. Um well actually, the, yeah, with a, his play was more linear earlier, now that you mention it. Linear, I mean, um, instead of just staying to the root note, maybe answering with a small phrase. Yeah, yeah. And that's the stuff that people might not notice, but if you took it out of the song, people go, What happened to the song? You yeah, know, it's like yeah. one of those really makes the song. In a tasteful way, I you know not till uh, not till you just said that did I really put that together? Because yeah. it was less of that later on, <clears throat> as they got heavier. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, he, there, there he's more sort of following the riff and provide you know doing you know going back to the root note or stuff like that. Um, oh yeah, Mark. Um, oh sorry. Okay. Uh, so as a fan, <clears throat> I asked why Downing once. Oops uh rejoin the band spend so much time training yeah well see the behavior thing i i that's what i'm trying to get at is his behavior uh suggests that he doesn't care about judas priest but rather his own status oh i mean good good, good point I, yeah. i'm gonna have to say that you know uh to him there's no priest that isn't kk's priest no i don't think you're being harsh mark I, this is a good point um but i feel he already established his influence on metal history that's right why can't he be focused on the welfare of the band? That's a, that's a really good point. And the fact that I was, I guess you articulated better than me when I was saying if he stuck to his good points and stopped the trash talking, that undermines the whole thing. And I guess, Mark, what you're saying is um, he's, he's more concerned with making a name for himself or his own status, as you put it. I well, so, so let's, let's, there were a couple other ethical issues that I wanted to, yeah. Um, bring up here. Um, and I think this is a good segue into that. We've, I think we've talked enough about whether he has a legitimate claim that, you know, he ought to be welcomed back. Maybe, maybe there isn't a, a, a right or claim like that. Um, and another one of the things that we've touched on is how, how should these disagreements or demands be conducted by those involved? Is there a classy way to do this? Or, you know, is everybody entitled to say whatever the hell they want to because they're metal guys? I think we've talked enough about that. Um, one of the key issues that has come up, and actually there was a, le a little bit of a legal thing going on, is K.K. Downing entitled to use the priest name? And I don't mean legally entitled. I mean, can he call, can, it, does it make sense for him to talk about K.K.'s priest? That's the, that's the name of his band. Um, and he clearly thinks so, right? He clearly thinks that he is uh, maybe the best representative of, of Judas Priest. Um, should he have called it something different? Mm. What, what do you think? Well, in calling it Keiki's priest, he's he's living off the priest's name. Yeah. Um, he could have started a new project, though. That yeah, was, like like Halford with Fight, right? That's it, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I mean, they not that he put an album out under the priest name, right? Yeah. Um, it could have been something else, like uh. Um, when George Lynch left, he did Lynch Mob, right? And sure, right. there'd be a couple of docking tunes in the set, but he played the Lynch Mob stuff. So it was, he was going to go out and write music. Why not start his own project? And then, because he was in Priest, 
throw in maybe four classic songs in the set. Uh, and that's what Halford did. You know, mm -hmm. when Halford did his solo, you know, it's just called Halford. Right. Um, um, he, yeah. He, and like, and did, some, a few priest songs. Yeah. I mean, did Bruce Dickinson do Maiden songs at all when he was off on his own? Or did Adrian Smith? I mean, I think they'd be the, like the closest correspondents, you know, for yeah, a comparison. Yeah, I don't know if he did. It wouldn't surprise me if he, you know, threw three in for the fans. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he had his own albums out and he was, when he tour, he would do the Bruce Dickinson <laughs> set. You know, that's that's how Paul Diano screwed himself, actually, when he left Iron Maiden. Uh, well, he didn't leave. He was kicked out. Right? Yeah. Um, he he was asked by, you know, the concert promoters to do a couple Iron Maiden songs. He was like, I'm not doing any of that stuff. I'm doing my own new stuff, you know. And, you know, he didn't get any traction with it, unfortunately. And if he right. had done Maiden stuff, he probably would have come out a bit better. You know, Dio mm -hmm. always did on stage some Rainbow stuff, some Black Sabbath stuff. Yeah. Um in addition to Dio stuff so yeah he did and you know and the stuff that he did with the band of course you know um I always find it odd that when people are uh like the band Kansas when Steve Walsh left uh uh John Elefante joined and he put out three records with them but now when he does appearances he does songs he didn't play on he does carry on my wayward son that was Steve Walsh he does yeah, all the yeah. stuff that from Kansas that he did not that wasn't his songs that's kind of strange but um but i, I you know, maybe that shows a certain kind of like easy goingness or generosity to be able to recognize you you know you talked about the contract or not or not the contract but the relationship with fans the fans do want to hear those old standards right yeah yeah i you know but like he had big hits with kansas like play the game tonight and fight fire with fire and yeah and like, I would imagine he would want to do those, but. Um... Yeah. Chris has a really interesting point here that I want to, we'll come back to the, the yes personnel thing, but he says, KK is classic Judas Priest. I always picture KT, KK and Tipton in my mind. You think about like these, those posters we would get in circus and put on our walls or something yeah. like that. So I want to push this a little bit. Um, I, I think. Chris is right. KK is classic Judas Priest. He's not the Judas Priest of firepower, obviously. Um, maybe if you contributed enough to the classic thing, you get to use the, the concept of the name. Right. You know? um, may, you know, cause the way that, that KK Downing is positioning KK's priest is it's, it's like, a, it's what Judas priest ought to have been. It, it, it reminds me of, uh, there's this band orchid in, in doom metal. And one of the best things I've ever seen written about them is they play the songs that Sabbath never wrote, you know? <laughs> so it's like, and, and I think it's a great descriptor of their wow. sound. Um, yeah. maybe, maybe what KK Downing conceives of himself as doing is, producing the songs that Judas Priest should have made, except in a, you know, 2022 or 2021 format, you know, with uh, the electronics and the new drumming techniques and stuff like that. Mm. Um, you know, the other thing too is with the Priest name, I don't know if you, if you bring in other members who've been in the band, does that enhance your ability to use that name? So like um, if you're, um, in this case, we, we've got Tim Ripper, Owens, and Les Binks who play with it. So three three members of a five piece band are priest members affiliated. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe that that raises it. So like, let's say Iron Maiden, um, Adrian Smith, and um, uh, Adrian Smith leaves again, and he's like, I'm gonna make Adrian Smith's Iron Maiden, and he gets Blaze Bailey. To, to, to play with him and he, and he can't get Clive Burke because he's dead but right uh, who who else could he could he pick up you know um, I, I don't know about the old really old Iron Maiden members that would be floating around out there um, right but you know if he got enough of them would he have, would he have legitimacy in saying this is uh, Adrian Smith's Iron Maiden you know yeah, you know now that you put it this way he went on to do Adrian Smith and project he didn't mm -hmm. to me <clears throat> all these people that were comparing KK to did not go do a, 
uh, another version of the band uh, that yeah. they left. Yeah. Um, this is actually, these are really kind of strong points. Um, the more I think about it, you know, KK should just make a new band and fans of Priest would love it, you know, but now we have this, now we got to take sides and, you know, I got to, I got to talk. <laughs> Which is the that. real Priest. Yeah. 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 Right. I mean, you know, that's, that's, that's tiring for the fans, you know, um, well, right. And, 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 and Mark so has a good, good point here. As much as a jerk is downing as being, I think artistically, it's good that we can experience both versions of these bands. Downing has the opportunity to make his iteration interesting, but I doubt he'd take it. Well, I, I do want to say I've, I've listened to um, recently, I listened to KK Downing uh, uh, Priest. What is the name of the, the album? Um, he's, got, he's got this Sermons of the Sinner. And I've only listened to it once. And I actually was texting Scott back and forth because I was listening to it at the gym. And I was like, well, you know, this, this actually sounds more like metal church than like priest, you know, the first song. Uh, but, you know, by the, by the middle part, I was like, this is good stuff. It's not great. It's not like you're listening to it and you're like, oh my God, this is amazing stuff, right? But it's not, it, it, it's, it's good. It's, I won't even say it's not bad because it is good. And yeah. There's, you know, uh, there's some good chops on it. I'm, I'm kind of happy to see that, you know, it's, it's there. Um, I, I would, I would say, um, you know, listening to other people that have left bands like Herman Frank has put out a number of really great albums recently. Herman Frank of Accept, uh, who was treated really shabbily by um, uh, uh, Wolf Hoffman, uh, as is almost everybody involved in Accept. Yeah, right. That's right. Um, and uh, I would say that's better than KK's Priest, but this is a very subjective thing, right? And when it comes to, to newer classic metal stuff. Oh, Chris, Chris. I know, up. I saw that. Yeah. That's yeah. I mean, there, there are quite a few feuds from these bands that were like really like powerhouses in, in the 70s, right? Uh, and then made it, made it into the 80s. Um, I yeah, guess Roger Pink, Waters. Pink Floyd would be a, a massive one, right? Yeah, and um, this is all secondhand, but I've, I've had friends that worked on Roger Waters shows and stuff said he's got to be the most biggest prick. <laughs> <laughs> they just said, you know, he even comes off that way on the DVD that he did like 20 years ago. And it just shows him like yelling at everyone, like telling the sound guy he doesn't know how to do his job and it's my way to the highway. And, oh. Um, so, and, you know, David Gilmore seems like the sweetest, like laid back, kind of generous kind of guy. And um, I'll have to follow that link because I, I wonder if there's stuff that I don't know in there. Um, yeah, yeah, what is it? Old Diva. Yeah, that's Chris. You're right. And it's a great show. I mean, Dave Kilminster is his guitarist, I think, still. Is Dave Kilminster still his guitarist? I know Dave a bit. He's the he's guy from England, a really great guitar player. And um, you know, although he's, you know, he didn't tell me, he didn't tell me anything especially negative. He just said it was kind of, it was, you know, it was, uh, you, you, you got, uh, you got paid for how hard you worked or whatever is, you know. Um, but I've heard people that have worked the shows that are just kind of like, he, he was yelling at people, you know, mm. you know, some kid that's supposed to have his towel or something. <laughs> Radio Chaos tour. Oh, you saw that? Oh man, I do love that album. That's a good one, Chris. Yeah, he did, you know, he did great stuff. I think he's great. It's just, that's the biggest feud. When they did, what was it, Live 8 together? They actually joined up and uh, we all thought, well, Pink Floyd's getting back together. No. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it's funny because Roger Waters just talks smack. Like, oh, it was David Gilmore's, you know, uh, he really wanted to do it, but I, you know, um, I just kind of ignored him and we did it for a cause, but you know, I have no mm. interest in, you know, and he just shot his mouth off, but David Gilmore didn't say anything. Yeah. Uh, but this is really, uh, and, and it's, of course, you know, if we think about Pink Floyd, if they were to get back together, that would be ideal. Although in the eighties, they did, they did it without him and it was something different. Like Tony Levin was playing bass with. Yeah. Him. Yeah. I mean, this raises a question that we brought up earlier. If there is this much bad blood between people, can you actually successfully bring them together? Put aside the, like, they don't know the catalog anymore. They're, you know, yes. maybe out of shape or something like that. I mean, and in, in this case, could 
KK Downing actually work with a guy who he thought was a clone of himself? Could he work with Ian Hill, who he says, you know, stabbed him in the back? Could he work with the Glenn Tipton, who he had all these complaints about over all these years? I just don't see it happening. And and could could Roger Waters really work with David Gilmore if you brought them back together? I I, I don't see that happening. You know. No. I think David would be open to, I don't know. I mean, I'll have to read this, this link that Chris put because there's probably much more uh, I wouldn't uh, f- learn from it, but you know, you're, you're right. I mean, <laughs> I <don't laughs> look at Chris so basically what you're saying is that KK is screen. <laughs> that's basically what I'm saying. Yeah. Good pun, yeah. <laughs> so heads are going to roll. We have, that's our second priest pun of the day. Yeah. We should um, probably work some more in before before we, we add. But, you know, if you think about it, to go back to like Metallica and Dave Mustaine, I, I read Mustaine's autobiography and his autobiography is, there, this is also something I want to say about autobiographies after this too. Mustaine's autobiography is very unvarnished. He's very clear about where he screwed up and, you know, what a jerk he was and stuff yeah. like that. He also, you know, paints a, a, a very clear picture of the Metallica guys being jerks too, you know, particularly James Hetfield and, and Lars Ulrich. Um, and, you know, he reconciled with them eventually. And he and he did do things like where they would be in a tour together or that, that thing where they all got up on stage and did Diamond Heads, Am I Evil, where it was them and, and guys from Slayer and guys from uh, Anthrax, right? Yeah. So he, he could cooperate with them. But you'd never see Dave Mustaine saying, I want back in Metallica or something like that. You know? That's a good point because, well, he, like we were just talking about before, he went out and started his own band with his own music. And why can't KK do that? Well, he I did mean, effectively do that. Right. I mean, well, just, he's just calling it KK's priest. Well, that's what I mean. He's a, he's a in direct competition with the band he wants to join. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a good question though. So I think you're right. He is, po- he's positioning it as competition. <laughs> Yeah, maybe this, like Mark was saying, you know, maybe it's good to have these two bands out there. Maybe it, it like increases album sales and awareness for both bands, right? So all of this bullshitting around and making all these complaints, it's certainly bringing Priest and KK Downing's Priest uh, into, you know, all, all the the music forums. Um, will this result in in greater attendance at tours or better sales of the priest album that they're working on currently, or the, um, uh, you know, recent, um, album, uh, that, that, uh, here, the sermons of the sinner. Um, maybe, you know, I, I don't know, but, um, yeah, I mean the whole, the, the, you just put a, a great list about a minute ago that I, I wanted to respond to. You know, he can't work with this person. This person stabbed him in the back. Now, now I'm starting to ask myself, why does he want back in? Right? Well, I mean, I can think of a couple motives. One would be that he feels that he was um, treated badly, embarrassed, you know, maybe even humiliated. And this would be a way of overcoming that. Um, I, and actually, this is a great segue. So, you know, reading these two autobiographies, KK Downing, Heavy Duty, Days and Nights and Judas Priest and Rob Halford's Confess, they both grew up in the same area in very similar environments, and they both spent a good bit of time on their childhoods. And it's, it's quite interesting to see um, KK Downing had a shitty, shitty childhood, you know, oh. very clear, you know, um, just, you know, the first couple chapters are about all the different things that were happening and, you know, disappointments and the family situation that they were in. Rob Halford's childhood was not ideal, but they go through some of the same stuff and it's like totally different stuff that totally different ways in which it's, it's, it's happening uh, to the, to the two young, young kids in this, this, you know, industrial impoverished part of, of Britain and, you know, you actually kind of feel as you're reading through it, you feel for KK Downing, not just as like, oh, well, he, he had a bad childhood and stuff like that. You see how this kind of trauma and deprivation plays itself out in people's lives, even as they become adults and they try to move past it and they, they don't quite get past it. So, you know, maybe for somebody like that, 
the um, feeling like your bandmates, people that, that, you know, as Richie Faulkner pointed out, you were connected with for 40 years are treating you as if you don't matter. Maybe that stings more mm -hmm. than if you had a, mm -hmm. a, a more stable background, you know? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, uh, we, I mean, how old are they now? They're in their 60s. Are they in their mid 60s? Uh, I want to say either that or early 70s. Yeah. Um, I, because, you know, you know, as a know, matter of fact, KK Downing is in his 60s because okay. I remember just talking with, I think so, but approaching 70. Um, I remember talking with Andy about this a little bit before and comparing him to like, you know, well, my dad was born in this year. KK Downing was born in that year, you know? Oh, gotcha. Um, I just, you know, you know, born in, uh, born in 51. So he is, he is 70. Oh, he's born in 51. Okay. 70 right now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, I guess what we're deciding is we don't feel like KK's handling it in, in a great way. I mean, um, and, you know, the childhood, I mean, you know, Rob, like you said, had a tough childhood, but I don't see him acting like KK about this, right? Like, I don't know, did he sling a lot of mod at KK in his book? No, not that much. Um, as a matter of fact, Rob Halford's book is, is a lot more centered around, as you would guess, um, issues of sexual identity. Okay. And, you know, I mean, being knowing that you're gay from, from 10 years old. Um, and yeah. it, is, it is interesting because he does bring up the fact that um, this is kind of a nice, nice note to, to go out on. His bandmates were incredibly supportive of that. They never gave him a hard time. Um, and, and, you know, if you think about like, even just when we were kids, you know, right. growing up um, the uh, if you got, got viewed as being gay in the Midwest and you were, you were a, a boy, wow. You'd get your, your, butt kicked all the time and stuff like that. Rob Halford is growing up in, you know, uh, industrial uh, England in, you know, a, a much earlier time where, boy, you could have gotten the crap beaten out of you. And he's going around trying to hook up with guys while he's on tour. I mean, he could have gotten in, in lots and lots of problems. And his, you know, his, his band, well, at least KK Downing says, we all knew he was gay. There wasn't any doubt about this. Wow. You know, we just didn't talk about it, you know, and they didn't talk about it. Not because it was like, oh, terrible secret must hide under the rug. And they're just like, we're not going to make an issue of this because the, the poor bastards already got it hard enough, you know? Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it, it was probably extra challenging being this kind of like sort of macho metal front man. You know, um, yeah, yeah. you know, is he gonna, there's a thought of, am I letting my fans down when it comes out or, um, but yeah, so I, that's interesting. I'll have to actually read Rob's book because that's, I mean, um, I will say these, these, these are both co-written books, you know, where right. it's not, it's not a ghostwriter. It's somebody who worked with, with them. Right. They're both great autobiographies. Um, you, you get a lot of insight into their characters, um, what was going on in the band, sort of complimentary views of things. Yeah. I would love to see Glenn Tipton or Ian Hill do a book like this to get to see what they think about stuff would be quite, quite cool. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, They're definitely. Well, before we go, because I know we're, we're a bit over time and I, I have a, a thing to do at the top of the hour any other ethical issues that we should hash out or, or discuss? I think we've actually covered quite a lot of ground in talking about this and managed not to you know, say, well, Jeremy Bentham would say, or Emmanuel Kant would say, we, we've done it in, in a more, more grounded way, I would say. Yeah. Um, um, and you know, lots of good input and, and suggestions and analogies from our uh, interlocutors. Uh, Mark and and Chris and Rob, but yeah, is there I, anything else we should we should hit on? Do you think, or that we've missed? Well, I think you know. Oh. Um, so wait, well, yeah. Should bands share songwriting credits on all songs? I mean, that's how Van Halen did it. So there'd never be a well, money issue. As a musician, Scott, what do you think about that idea? If I'm in a band, yeah. Um, 
yeah i mean money becomes an issue in those relationships you know bands um you know people start to feel uh unappreciated so it's you know like the go-go's was like that's the priceless one and they hated what was it? was it gina shock no anyways they couldn't stand her because they're like why is she rich and we we're only making money off gigs and they're like because there's this thing called publishing she yeah. wrote all the songs she makes the money and um you know they they're notorious for hating each other by the next the second tour they hated each other and um so i think in a band situation if you're going to be big, especially back in the day, that that it will definitely at least take the money issue off the table. However, if there's somebody that's the main songwriter, it's kind of like they're doing all the work, but everybody's getting paid the same. So it's like doing group projects in in, in uh, high school, right? And one person would always do the whole thing, and nobody else yeah. would show up. Yeah, I used to hate those. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Um. So that's tricky. Um. I've been in, you know, I've been in songwriting situations where I've co-written a song with a, with a songwriter and then, okay, we'll split this 50, 50. And then somebody will like make a, oh, you need to change this one chord in the bridge. I want 25% of it. And then the person took 25% of my 50 and they kept their 50. So I'm mm -hmm. like, you mean, I've written all the music to this and one person changes one chord and I'm getting as much as the person that just changed one chord that didn't need to be changed. You know, um, it's a touchy subject from different points of view. It's, I don't think it's an ideal way to, to end, you know, to, there's not a flawless way to do it. But if you do take money out of the equation and everybody's getting paid, that tends to be the most successful. So Mark has a, a good quip. Plato would say, this is why you lock the poets out of the city. Um, well, that's the ideal city, right? And we, and we live in the non-ideal world of uh, all this craziness. But I, I think it's important to hash these these things out. I, I, I think a lot of the discourse that we're finding about these um, this issue it, or connected issues in the forums is, on the one hand, like poorly informed, like they're they only know one side of the story and they're not really thinking it out, or it's kind of knee jerk reaction, you know. So I'm bringing some some philosophical reflection to it i think is is quite helpful yeah i mean and it's and it turns out it's not really an easy it's it, it is complicated um, yeah yeah I, I think it comes down to uh um kk it, it doesn't it comes a lot of it is it just come down to if he has the right to join the band it, a lot of it has to do with his behavior i think that we've talked about yeah about doing that and about maybe we're questioning what if if what he's doing is the right thing to do you know instead yeah. of just doing a, a solo project of his or starting a new band yeah. um like everybody else does um and then of course you know not trash talking you know why, why would you want to join a band of everybody that stabbed you in the back or you know it wasn't a good experience you're telling me some people didn't even wait to like quit a band to start trash talking. Think about Kevin Dubrow with Quiet Riot in the yeah. 1980s, you know, trashing Motley Crue and Van Halen and Rat and anybody else from LA as not being, you know, as great as them to the point where like actually fans would get ticked off about it in the concert. You know? So, so, so there, I guess there's a lot of that in, in metal, but I don't know if there's more of that in metal than in, in some other genres. Like maybe there's more of it in metal than in soft rock, but I don't know about, you know, metal versus like rap and hip hop on that or the jazz scene or um, maybe people are mean to each other or disparaging uh, in any anything you can pick. Yeah, I mean, with metal, yeah, you, you outspoken, I guess, is the word. Um, and a yeah. lot of people think they're going to say something and they're going to be welcome with open arms and maybe they're surprised that it didn't work out that way you know you know uh making fun of van halen it's not a good idea you know yeah it's not good for business it's not well good. we get to make fun of van halen when they become van hagar <laughs> <laughs> but that wasn't what kevin dubrow was complaining about at the time right no i mean that, that was still when he was i mean that was 80 around when 1984 came out right kevin dubrow was yeah. 
fucking early on, I thought. Yeah, like 80, 82, 83, 84. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. So, um, yeah, I just, uh, I don't like seeing that stuff just as, as an artist. I mean, p- there's people around town that, that will do it to people, uh, other players in the city or whatever. Um, but, you know, to uh, like stuff getting put in print all the time. And now, you know, it's- there's, there's always the risk is coming across as primarily driven by resentment or envy or some other negative emotion. Well, that's, and, yeah. yeah. And, it, 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 and it could look petty or it could look. That's a good um, word. Yeah. yeah yeah, it's just uh and i don't know like what's the do you do they feel they did kevin think he was looking cool by saying that like you know um you know there is something there is something about like when you're angry about stuff and you say disparaging things about other people one of the dangerous things about anger is it makes us feel like we're so right you know like we're in a groove and you know so we say things and then you know we think that we're like expressing the best ideas in the world and other people are like what is wrong with this guy <laughs> actually that's a really think, good point yeah i think that's what happened with kevin dubrow and maybe maybe that's what's going on here with with our interpretation of kk downing um, who probably has a lot more, you know, weight to what he's he's saying right. in his complaints. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, so here's a great thing for us to end on. Mark has uh, a good distinction. We <laughs> want loud heavy metal, not a loud bunch of whining. <laughs> There's something not, it's not very metal to whine, is it? So, you know what, it's not. <laughs> it's not. So, so that's a great place to end. Uh, thanks everybody for their their comments and uh, the conversation. You. Thanks again, Scott, for being here. And oh, it's always we'll, so much fun. We'll see you all next time. See you, everyone.